here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastor. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of the writer and author Audrey Golden, who I spoke to very recently to find out all about her latest book that's just been published. It's titled, I Thought I Heard You Speak, Women at Factory Records. This has just come out on White Rabbit Books and it's going to be available from all good bookshops and also online. It's in hardback at the moment, but it's a brilliant read, so do check it out. But this is the interview, so after several minutes of interesting but casual chat, we get down to that exciting subject that was really the background to Factory and um, then from then we're just going to discuss the book in great detail. Anyway, Audrey, it's over to you. Yeah, absolutely. So Factory Records started kind of a Officially in 1978, uh, started first doing nights called Factory Nights at the Russell Club and some other places around Manchester, putting bands on, um, most notably Joy Division, of course. (laughs) Um, I think the original favorite factory band. And it was founded initially by Tony Wilson, Alan Erasmus, Peter Saville, uh, and Rob Gretton, and Martin Hannett, and it became really a cultural sensation in a lot of ways. I think that happened in large part due to the kind of fame New Order got with the release of Blue Monday and the way New Order kind of blew up after Blue Monday. But Factory developed the Hacienda, the famous or infamous dance club, of course, in Manchester, however you want to think of it, that really ushered in a new kind of club for Manchester and for the UK, I think, more broadly, and really gave a different kind of uh, cultural shift, not just for Manchester, but for thinking about what a record label could do. Then it, of course, opened Dry 201, the bar, so really showed it could get its arms into all kind of aspects of culture, not just music and dance, but food as well. And had an arm in New York as well of Factory New York that actually started as Factory America and worked with Michael Schomburg in New York to get a lot of really amazing film directors to direct music videos for Factory bands as MTV was kind of blowing up. Um, In recent years, Factory has remained, I think, really uh, at the forefront of thinking about indie music labels and um, interesting uh, cultural production in all kinds of ways. So so I hope that's a good introduction. <laughs> yes, it's a good And also just because, I mean, 78, the late 70s in the UK, I mean, it was kind of a quite a grim time. You know, there was still a lot of kind of unemployment and there wasn't that much kind of optimism in the air. Plus, I... I suppose by that period, we'd had the punk world of um, 78 to 78, um, 76 to 78, 79 time. And um, yeah, so so it was kind of an interesting period that it started. And also 79 was when Thatcher and the, and the Conservative government sort of took a, a hold. And so independent label, the independent label was still a relatively new concept because up to then, I, I'm guessing, you know, it was kind of just the majors like um, RCA and EMI and and various and I suppose Island Records. I'm not sure if that's an independent or not. Actually, damn. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So yeah. so factory factory seemed a very radical new kind of business, didn't it? Even though mm-hmm. they probably would have hated the B word, but it was it was definitely <laughs> a new the new kid on town with a new sound because because there was the punk period, but then music was very dominated. I think with the the prog rock world, wasn't there? There was Yes and Genesis and Wishbone Ash and and those super groups that were there with a the heavy metal. So so there wasn't that that indie scene that hadn't really developed until that period of factory and then into the 80s. So that was that was kind of an interesting moment with dear old yeah, Tony Wilson and his gang. So did you I mean what was it Tony who was the kind of the the kind of the catalyst for this experience? Um, for factory in yes. general? You know, I think it was a lot of different people. I think and hope that one of the things my book really shows is that there were a lot of people working behind the scenes from the very start that helped to kind of give Factory the footing it needed to get to where it ultimately, you know, got. 
Um, I think Tony Wilson, as a lot of people describe him, women in my book, but also others, a kind of real big ideas person. Um, mm -hmm. I think he had a lot of ideas. And I think there were a lot of people that maybe don't get named as much that were helping to put a lot of those ideas into practice to kind of turn factory into this thing that it became. Yes, absolutely. I know, because because last summer, I think it was last summer, I went to, I sort of had a trip up north and went to Manchester to the exhibition, which had, you know, a little bit of a celebration of factory records, which was kind of, you know, it was kind of interesting. So it was lots of bits about it that I, I wasn't aware of, which was kind of interesting in itself. So with, um, so then you thought, I'm going to do a book, because frankly, we need to 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 have the narrative sort of um, sort of expanded, really. So, when did the idea of a publication and, and writing about the about factory records come to you? I mean, it, the really the initial idea I think came a long time ago when I started to realize that there were women who did really critical work for factory, but weren't getting named anywhere in the way that a lot of the men were who had been in and around the scene. Um, I worked uh, a long time ago um, near to where the old factory New York office was on Spring Street in Soho in New York City. And um, I think I've told this story, but I used to kind of walk by there and it was empty at this point and kind of peer in, you know, kind of imagine what had taken place in there. And uh, around that point started really collecting some of the factory stuff. At this point, I had been a huge fan of a lot of the factory bands and was just really interested in factory kind of in general as this cultural force and started buying some of the ephemera um, records where I could afford it. And, you know, women's names are on those, on the kind of famous and funky and amazing Christmas cards that Factory sent out. There are women's names. Yeah, none of these women's names were in any of the books that I'd read about Factory. Um, none of those women's names come up in 24-hour party people. And so I started doing a little more investigating and learning more about some of these women who had done this really critical work, women who had been working really tirelessly behind the scenes at the factory office, doing, you know, financial work, overseas licensing work, um, women doing PR uh, for the bands, for radio, women doing design work for record sleeves with Peter Saville Associates, women musicians, of course, who often aren't named among the kind of uh, in the upper echelons of the factory albums, I suppose, but who did incredible, uh, really did incredible albums and made really incredible music. So anyway, so I started to really think about a lot of these women, started talking to Tracy Donnelly, um, one of the really amazing factory women, and mentioned, this was a number of years ago now as well, maybe it could become a book. And Tracy kind of encouraged me to do it in a way that, you know, I was really excited about. And I don't know that I would have necessarily thought this, you know, women will speak to me for this if Tracy hadn't said, like, this really needs to be written. I knew it had to be written, but I didn't know if, you know, if everybody who I was thinking of would be willing to chat for the book. Um, and so I started making a list of women. It started out with maybe 20 to 25 names. I can't remember uh, exactly, but... It kept growing and growing. And the more women I spoke with, you know, they'd mention, have you spoken with so-and-so? Have you thought about trying to contact so-and-so? And so the list kept growing. And I kept thinking, wow, this is, I mean, this is an incredible history that really just doesn't exist in any form to date. And I knew it had to be written before, but as that was happening, that process was happening, I really knew this has got to be written. <laughs> Yes, my goodness. That's yes, no, fantastic. So when did when did that um when did that conversation happen with Tracy? And and you know, sort of what period were you talking about before you started doing the interviews? Yeah, I started really thinking about it seriously in like 2018, early 2019. So I think I did the first interview with Tracy right around then, um, and with Chris uh, Mathan, who was a um, a partner at Peter Saville Associates in 2018. So that was really the start of the whole thing. <laughs> yes, my goodness. I mean, it's kind of, it is interesting because, you know, I've been doing the C86 show and I've always been kind of really, I've, one thing that I really liked about the indie pop world was that it, it, there was, it seemed much more of a balance, you know, gender wise. And there mm -hmm. wasn't just the bloke boy, you know, the boy bands. And then, oh yes, we must mention a couple of women. 
Oh, that's yeah. enough of that. So it was, okay. you know, it's kind yeah, of interesting yeah. that, that actually, you know, you've really, but you've really focused on on it in in such a way. So that it keeps it kind of quite clean, really, doesn't it? But rather than trying to sort of mix the the story between, you know, male female, it's like okay, we'll just have the story from the women's point of view as well. So so as so as we sort of progressed into the last decade and then into this one, did you find the pandemic then really helped kind of um, get interviews with people because because I've asked that because when I was doing my show you know sometimes it was a bit tricky and then suddenly the pandemic happened and people went I've got nothing on yeah I'll give you an interview did you did you have a similar experience yeah I think I really did um I was in New York City when the pandemic started which was a really harrowing experience that I won't get on to you know or won't get into for, for for this podcast but um you know, as things started to settle a little bit, I think it really did become a productive time where I was able to get people to agree to speak who might not have otherwise. And, you know, where it gave me time perhaps to do interviews over Zoom that I might not have, you know, been able to do or might not have gotten to for a little bit of time to come. Because initially I was thinking I would do a lot of these interviews in person. And of course, that became just absolutely impossible. Um, so, so yeah, so when I started reaching out to so many of these women, um, and when I knew I wanted this to be a book just told entirely from the perspectives of the women to kind of highlight the way their voices had been so marginalized within or kind of omitted from existing histories, I was really excited to realize so many of them were actually, you know, at home and willing to speak and willing to use Zoom, willing to use phone and willing to kind of turn that really awful time for the world into something, you know, productive. Yes, absolutely. And when did you get the idea of, you know, the chapters? Because you've got 16 kind of chapters on, on this in this book, you know, and and obviously, I say obviously it's not <laughs> obviously, but but, <laughs> but, but you know, when you get all the material and you think, oh, great, I've been really enjoying this. I've now up to 100, 200 interviews and they've all been brilliant. Yeah. You know, I've really learned so much yeah. and I think, yeah. oh, wow, now I've got to do the next thing. When did when the I, the idea of the, in, you know, the chapters come in? Did, did you have the chapters before or did they sort of think, OK, I've got to try and get some sort of sense of structure here? Um, the idea for the overarching thematic chapters, the big chapters, was something I was thinking about almost from the start. I knew I wanted to do something that didn't just tell a chronological story, because I find often when chronological stories exist, people come to think that that's the kind of only history that exists. And there's no room for the kind of bumpiness or waywardness of history. And those kinds of chronological or timeline stories are the ones that so often tend to marginalize women's voices from them. So I knew I wanted to do something that wasn't strictly chronological, that was, you know, constructed thematically ra rather than along this kind of, you know, um, your listeners aren't going to know what I'm doing, but a kind of straight timeline. <laughs> I'm doing it with my hand, right? A yes. straight <laughs> timeline without, you know, any room for any anomalies or anything like that. But as I was going through the interviews and really piecing together the book, and I'll say, you know, I think sometimes oral histories look like, oh, somebody just kind of put all this stuff together. But it's a it's a knitting and weaving process that is really, you know, intricate and complex. So it actually is a um, a real uh, labor of love in this case, putting these stories together. But as I was doing that work, some of those mini chapters started to kind of jump out to me. So those were um, those, those were little parts of the book that I started to think about as I was putting it together. And I realized some of these stories, many that I wasn't honestly expecting when I started the interviews, really needed to have their own chapters and needed to stand out in a way that really highlighted them. So one that immediately jumps to mind for me is the mini chapter on Yasmin, um, the first woman door, door man, and I'm doing man in yes. quotes, uh, <laughs> scare quotes, um, in England. Uh, I, I was so, so incredibly thrilled to be able to track down her sister, um, Soraya, to speak with Soraya about Yasmin after so many women were bringing her up. Um, 
he hasn't passed away in 2011. So I wasn't able to speak with her for the book, but that was a mini chapter that I thought, oh, this has got to be its own, you know, little standout part. The mini chapter on Linda's meat dress uh, and Liz Naylor going shopping for a dildo with, um, <laughs> with Linda, that, that as well needed to be a mini chapter unto itself. So a lot like that. Yes. And there's, there's a couple of people that you've managed to interview or get in the book, which I'm so impressed with. I mean, Kath Carroll, did you how did you manage to get Kath on this on this project? Because she'd obviously been a, a, around the scene and was an NME journalist as well as in Meow and yes. guested on various indie songs by people like the Hit Parade. So um, but she's somebody who's really gone to ground. So did did you manage to how how did you manage it? What was your magic technique? I think I largely have Liz Naylor to thank for that. Um, Liz Naylor put me in touch with Kath. Um, and I think, you know, after speaking with Kath, I think and hope that, you know, she felt in some ways like parts of her story had been mischaracterized or parts of her experience had been mischaracterized. And this was a real remedying of that in a way. So when I was putting together the book, I wanted to make sure especially that those moments where she wanted to kind of remedy the story and set a story straight and tell her version of events, that those um, were really highlighted in the book um, in ways that I think I think were important to her, but you know became important to me as somebody trying to to tell a different uh, story of factory that really filled in gaps, but also created a new narrative of the label. Yes, no, it's uh, this. You know, it's kind of interesting because I know, she, you know, she's. You know, there's a couple of people from that. You know, I suppose the '80s, probably every decade, who you know are still about, but no one's ever yeah. heard from them for decades. And and when I saw her name, I thought, oh, that's amazingly impressive. Um, <laughs> she must have went, yeah, it's got that one. I mean, with with the story, did you did you yeah. find though with with doing your interviews because they are often quite fascinating that you started getting too much material and then started to feel how how were you going to condense it? I mean, the editing process must have at times been quite difficult thinking I really want to put that in and then someone saying well sorry but that book's going to be so big <laughs> so how did you yeah so how did you manage to uh, yes. edit things down <laughs> this this is quite you might, it's like having a child that you've got to I don't know not quite but you know what I mean it's like it's yeah, quite yeah, tricky yeah, when it when something yeah. you think that's brilliant but that's going to have to go it's really hard work. I mean, you know, the first draft of this was literally double the length of what it is in published form. And it was really tough to edit because when I was putting this together, I was thinking about the way certain oral histories, narrative oral histories are constructed, which kind of aim to, I'm quoting, or sort of quoting from Legs McNeil and Jillian McCain here, um, cutting the fat from the bone. So trying to strip away anything that isn't simply telling a story in a particular way. But for me, I really wanted this book to highlight a lot of the experiential knowledge of the women I was interviewing and to really show how their experiences, even in perhaps, you know, seemingly minor anecdotes or, or kind of events that might not make their way into something deemed a definitive history are really important to capturing their voices. So when I was editing, I wasn't trying to, you know, cut the so-called fat from the bone, but was rather trying to think about the ways that uh, voices wove together and how experiences wove together in particular ways and how, you know, the book would be interesting and exciting for a reader and could really capture a new history of factory. So that those were kind of my aims in editing. And it's hard. I mean, it's it's really hard. <laughs> it's difficult work. Yeah. I, yeah, no, it must have been really tricky. And also keeping <laughs> so many interviews in your mind. Did you get a did you have to do a bit of a storyboard? Did you just have lots of post-it notes all over your wall? Or did you have it all on a computer for sort of bits and pieces that you shuffled about? It was a mix. I did a lot of physical things, um, kind of uh, printing things, cutting them apart, laying them, you know, in different patterns on uh the big rug in my office, um, and also working on the computer. Uh, I'm lucky in that I think over the years, or maybe just naturally, I don't know how it works, I have a really, really good memory. And so um, I, so I've been told as well, I don't think it's just me, but um, 
I I think in ways maybe maybe other writers I'm not sure um, aren't necessarily able to do especially doing interviews I'm able to remember a lot of things that came up and also as I was doing interviews I kept a notebook with any kind of notes about things that I knew I wanted in the book that came up in the interviews and so I was kind of referring to that also for this book I um, I transcribed everything myself. I sent the transcripts to the women to approve. I looked back over their transcripts with any edits or revisions. And so I had also kind of been in, you know, just deep into these interviews, both orally, so hearing them, writing them out and reading them for so long that I came to know them in a way that I think I was able to start visualizing things both in my head, on my rug and on the computer. Yes, God, that that is amazing because that's you know there's a lot of there's a lot of voices here, isn't there? And yeah. um, yes, yeah, sort of keeping that story and sort of and that flow going. It, yeah, it, it's it's quite yeah, it is quite amazing. Did you did you find though with with a lot of them was there? I mean, probably for a lot of people on, in this book, they they haven't been interviewed before, and they, yeah. they, this story has been laying there for nearly forty years. Did mm-hmm. did a lot of people? find it quite therapeutic to be able to talk to you and give you their story after all this time because um yeah it, it's just kind of one of those things I've vaguely experienced myself and also a, f- a few times I think people have said actually I wouldn't have said I would have said no to you about five or ten years ago but mm-hmm. with the passing of time <laughs> I'm yeah. just about over that experience of being in a band or running a record label did you did you have similar kind of um, responses at times with people just telling you so much stuff you went wow that's that's I've only talked I've only asked two questions and you just given me everything because you've bottled it up it was kind of a mix honestly I mean I I can think of some you know particular women who seemed really glad to be to have been asked to tell their story and really eager to tell their story and who had you know a lot to say kind of from the start uh I'll say there were also a number of women who I had to kind of coax into, you know, agreeing to speak with me for the book. There were people I contacted who told me initially when I came to them, you know, well, so-and-so wrote a book or so-and-so wrote a book and didn't ask me to speak for that. So I just don't know that my story is very important. Otherwise, I think they would have asked me. And so anytime I hear something like that, you know, then I kind of launch into my my spiel of, you know, explaining why, you know, histories uh, always omit voices, even when they have the best intentions, sometimes when they don't, and why it's so important to kind of tell your story. You know, if, when I spoke with DJ Paulette, um, I'm paraphrasing uh, her yeah. here, but she had said something along the lines of, you know, if you don't use your voice, it's kind of use it or lose it. And I think that, you know, was a really important point for people to think about who were kind of hesitant uh, to speak for the book. And um, I, when I spoke with Teresa Allen, um, someone who I, I think, I don't think she'd mind me saying maybe she was a little hesitant at first, but gave an absolutely incredible interview. And I just loved speaking with Teresa. And she said something to me in um, our interview that as soon as she said it, I made a little note to myself in my note, you know, the running notebook I mentioned that that's going to be the last thing to go in the book. That's going to be the last quote in the book. And it is. So I'll just, I'll leave that at that. And, you know, <laughs> listeners can pick up the book and read it. But I knew when I heard that, that's the end of the book. That's just, that's a perfect way to sum up everything, a perfect way to kind of sum up the way histories, you know, can um, can just perpetuate ideas of sexism, the way histories can omit women from really significant histories, but the ways women are participants in those histories and really enjoy being participants in those histories. And finally, just how critical, you know, remedial histories are to kind of retelling and reshaping um, popular narratives. Yes. If I had been more together with that point, I would um, I did an interview a few weeks ago with a woman who's put together a punk book from American punk bands, you know, with mm. the voices of women from something like 1978. 
1982. And I was thinking, oh, God, what was that? Oh, I've got it here. This is marvellous. Oh, this one here. Hit, hit Girls. Hit, yes. Hit Girls. So, yes. yes. I love that book. I think that's such a fabulous book, um, such an important addition to what I hope will soon become a different kind of canon. <laughs> yes. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting timing. Do you... I mean, do you have a theory of of the the kind of timing of all these things? I mean, not only the voices of women, but sort of things that happened over forty years ago. Is that, do you have a sort of theory of of why this is kind of happening now and not hap- hasn't happened in the past? I mean, I think there may be a handful of reasons kind of coming together, but I think perhaps just the recognition pretty recently that you know women's stories just often aren't told. Um, for a wide range of reasons. And I mean, you have books like Kim Gordon's memoir, um, Viv Viv Albertine's memoir coming out and, you know, making a huge splash and making clear that these incredible women musicians have stories to tell. Women have, you know, played, have played key parts in music histories. And I think books like those um, have helped to kind of make clear that there are all of these stories about women in music. And I kind of hate that term in some ways, women in music, because nobody talks about men in music, right? Yeah. But um, but women in music whose, whose voices have been so obscured or just haven't been kind of highlighted, who haven't been seen as important to various genres, to various forms, to various movements, to different histories as men. And I think that's starting to come right. I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. You know, I read statistics about how men generally tend to not read books written by women, might not read books about women, um, the ways that women authors even aren't read on the same level as uh, books by men. So I think it makes clear there's still a lot of work to be done, not just in terms of gender, but other, you know, other um, marginalized identity characteristics as well, of course. But I think it's starting to come right. And it seems like there's kind of, you know, a rolling wave that's, you know, pushing it along in a way that's really, really great. Yes. And with um, with Factory Records, obviously, there's um, been a bit like um, a lot of those indie labels during that period. Well, you know, just any business, really. I mean, you know, it, there's the honeymoon period. There's the kind of the, the wonderful sunset and everybody's happy. And then the the slight, you know, it all goes terribly wrong. When you were doing this this book as well, did you also follow that arc of the journey of Factory? Because it's kind of this fascinating kind of story with the early years, the post-punk period. And then there was, you know, Joy Division mm-hmm. type. And then there was various indie bands that probably didn't really make it then we had the new order period and then kind of the happy mondays and all this kind of the the business side that goes terribly wrong i mean did did you sort of really find out you know and see the characters and and where factory went wrong and what they should have done or could have done to have prevented that yeah they should have listened to the women. <laughs> should have listened. Yeah, no, they should have looked yeah. at those. <laughs> I, I think that was something that became really clear from um, the interviews I did and hopefully from my book. You know, Tina Simmons um, was a director at Factory, made a director. She's not often described as a director, but she was a director of Factory. And as she told me for the book, you know, she explained why the current financial model wasn't working and what they would need to do to fix it. And no one heard her, right? She spoke and no one heard her and factory went under. And then even toward the end, there were women in the office trying to keep things afloat. um, While often the kind of men behind or men who were the faces of the label were at the pub. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so I think in a lot of ways, you know, it made me wonder, well, some of these other labels that went under, were there also women working in the offices and behind the scenes explaining why the financial models were, you know, just not workable and how they could have been fixed and nobody listened to those women too? Um, so I think I think it does follow a knowable arc, but I think the book really reveals that, wow, maybe Factory could have continued for a lot longer if, if someone had trusted what Tina Simmons was saying. Yes. Tina Simmons, she was the one, wasn't she? <laughs> yeah, she was a, yeah. with when when she was telling her story, did you get that sense of exa- exasperation of like being there was a I think it was the Far Show where 
a social situation where all the men were talking and the women would say something really sensible and get ignored and then a man would repeat what she said and they would go oh that's amazing did did mm-hmm. they did a lot of people have that experience as well of being in that in you know environment even though it was supposed to be an indie lefty creative world it was still like actually the patriarchal kind of model still existed very much in those those situations both socially and in the in the business meetings yeah i think absolutely i mean i think women experience sexism um to varying degrees and kind of remember experiences of sexism to varying degrees because those are important distinctions to make i think as well um what you know you actually experience in the moment versus what you remember and how you reflect on it in different ways because um you know, our memories are are tainted by various things. And I think sometimes, you know, uh, memories of those experiences are kind of worsened by, you know, experiences that have been repeated. And sometimes, you know, they're looked back upon with kind of rose colored glasses because of how much fun factory was and how imaginative and creative it was. Um, so I think women had a really wide range of experiences with sexism. But, you know, Martine McDonough uh, in particular spoke with me about that particular phenomenon you're talking about, where you have an idea, you speak it, you're not heard, and then a man somehow miraculously, and I'm doing this in scare quotes again, has the same idea, and then he's taken seriously in a way that you're not. And I hate to describe anything as universal, but I think in a lot of realms, that's a kind of universal experience for women, certainly something I've experienced myself. So. Yes, that is annoying, isn't it? That must be like, yes. I mean, she was the 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 the, uh, the manager of James as well at this mm-hmm. stage, wasn't she? I mean, that yeah. that's kind of ex- an amazing experience. Obviously, they'd gone from a an indie band who were a little bit in the shadows of the Smiths. In all honesty, they were like fine, but we've got the Smiths, yeah. and then they become huge. I mean, how did mm-hmm. how did she experience? What was her experience like trying to navigate a band of men seven? men and then sort of the the record label and the industry itself did she did she come through that kind of relatively unscathed or is she s- still sort of processing it i think martine's still processing a lot of sexism that she you know experienced then and continued to experience but she's such an incredibly strong and brilliant woman and in terms of processing things she just thinks so carefully and thoughtfully about her experiences and is able to articulate them in ways that you know listening to her I feel like a lot of a lot of us feel like we could articulate and kind of think through so I think you know processing but processing really really amazingly in ways that uh, are really informative for other other women too. Was there a sense of regretting not responding to situations at that time and have been always been niggled by by them ever since, thinking I should have just said something or I should have said no? I'm not talking about something really heavy, but just mm-hmm. things that people often just put up with just to calm the waters, so to speak. I just wondered if there was kind of still those kind of feelings with people. You know, strangely, I didn't talk with many women that much about those feelings, about those types of regrets. Um, I think when, you know, when it all comes down (laughs) to it, to uh, quote Kath Carroll in some ways, um, you know, I think a lot of women tend to remember the ways that Factory gave them a kind of creative space to, to become creative people themselves and how even difficult experiences were learning experiences in different ways, and uh, and how a lot of their experiences were about work, um, rather than kind of reflecting on, you know, I could have done this, I should have done that. I think there were a lot of just experiences reflecting on the hard work, plus the fun of the time. Um, in terms of regrets, I'll say, you know, in the book, uh, readers will read about uh, Lindsay Reed's experience, and regretting that she didn't push to have herself called a co-director or a director of factory. And so I think that's one of those regrets that you're speaking of. And she talked with me specifically about um, how she felt like factory was her and Tony Wilson's baby. Uh, They were married when factory started. She talks about how they use, you know, both of their money to start the label and she wishes now she had been able to kind of think a little bit differently about her position 
Um, for what it's worth, when I heard that story from her, that was when I came up with that Mothers of Invention mini chapter. I thought, ah, oh, there are all kinds of ways to kind of be this mother role that doesn't necessarily mean having a child. Sometimes it means having a child, but sometimes it often doesn't, right? And I think just a little bit earlier, you actually described uh, my book as something like a child, something, you know, you're kind of holding, thinking about, like trying to improve, trying to help, trying to, you know, whatever. And so it's interesting to think about that maternal role in all kinds of ways. Yes, no, absolutely. Was there anything in particular that, you know, from doing the interviews that you discovered that you had no idea of before the project? You know, some some aspect that you thought, well, that's that's extraordinary. I had no idea that was that was part of what the narrative had been. A lot of things, actually. I mean, one of the stories, I mentioned this already, it was just Yasmin's story as being the first kind of woman bouncer in England. That's an incredible story. Why isn't that talked about more? Um, another story I just loved hearing about uh, was the kind of alternative space that the Hacienda became at different moments in time. I thought first, why isn't the story of the Hacienda as this kind of inclusive queer space with flesh nights? that kind of got started from the summer of lesbian love. Why isn't that talked about all the time and all these histories of the Hacienda? That's an incredible story about being able to, um, you know, come to a place and enjoy being yourself and enjoy music and feel free and open in ways that I think, you know, weren't always possible then and in that place. Uh, also the Hacienda, I loved hearing the stories about how the Hacienda wasn't just a place for music, but how fashion shows, art installations, kind of culinary delights were all part of making this space what it was. And so many of that work was done by women. So those were some really kind of extraordinary um, stories to me that I was so glad to hear about. But those are just a handful. I don't want to give away too much. No, no. But it's interesting <laughs> because we, we forget, well, I say we, I mean, I forget, but remind myself, you know, that d during the, the 80s, I mean, gay was still something that the tabloid press would hold against someone like, we know something and we're going to destroy you, but we'll just, mm -hmm. you know, let you bleed for a bit longer and have a few more yeah. sleepless nights. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, there was no football players, there's no sports people, there was no politicians were freaked out by it. And, you know, we, you know, in a way, I, all I can remember was Bronsky beat and Jimmy Somerville and probably um, Mark Armand as being quite mm -hmm. openly gay but most other people it was still like it was still a real taboo subject which it's boggling and then you know I suppose in 67 I think it was it was yeah it was still illegal wasn't it and then I think Roy Jenkins the the Labour Party MP had sort of pushed through a bill and suddenly homosexuality wasn't illegal anymore so it's it's kind of interesting when you mentioned that just the thought yeah. that, you know, during that period, it was still a big thing and it was still such a marginalised, you know, aspect of life's, you know, one's life. So, um, yeah, it's, it is interesting that I, you know, sometimes forget that, what it was like in the early 80s for anybody, really. Amazing, really. And it was, was it also where Madonna played her first ever live show was the Hacienda? Yeah, yeah, Madonna was there. I mean, that's one of the stories that I think, you know, people are surprised to know about because she was unknown, you know, relatively unknown then. And several of the women talked with me about how she, Madonna was kind of met with a lot of sexism from uh, club goers and no one was interested in seeing a woman dance um, to music at the Hacienda. And then, of course, you know, she became the Madonna that everybody, everybody <laughs> yes, knows. Yes, the course. unstoppable force yes, of Madonna yes. is this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, she absolutely. Was, uh, absolutely. And why, and, you know, because I, I sort of was looking at the front, you know, at the beginning of the mm -hmm. book going through it, there was a few people who declined to be interviewed, which I was, you know, I suppose a bit surprised me thinking, but they're normally yeah. all over the media. They're not people who we, one doesn't normally hear from. So why, what was what was the kind of, was there any particular reason that um, was it Miranda Sawyer and um, oh, is it Rowetta from um, the Happy Mondays? Did they did they sort of just decline the idea of being in the book? Oh, Miranda didn't actually decline. I was trying to reach out to her and kept trying to reach out to her on social media and just never heard back. And so, it, you know, it came time to turn in the book. So I actually don't know if Miranda would have right. talked okay. for the book. So she she might have. Um, Rowetta just really didn't want to be involved in the book. So I don't, 
I don't, I don't really know any more than that. I was, I was disappointed, of course. And I think her story is really important and she's, you know, such an important person in the happy Mondays, but yeah, had to live with that one. <laughs> this is, this is fantastic. And um, yes, I mean, with, with this project and I, I saw you, you do an awful lot of other amazing writing and, and reviewing what, what's your next project that you've got um in the sort of the wings have you got anything that's um coming up not soon probably these things take years don't they but yeah. have you got something else that you you know other books or projects that you've got in the um waiting to be birthed or whatever yeah i'm working on a book on the raincoats oh wow that's fantastic yes, yes that's... i'm i'm really really excited about it and uh i think it's you know I'm writing it, so of course I'm going to say this, but I really think it's going to be an incredible book that tells a story of a really incredible band that's had all of these um, just almost fantastical experiences over the last 40 years um, in kind of three different incarnations. Uh, you know, one life that started with rough trade um, and went until the mid 80s, another life that kind of came about again with DGC and Kurt Cobain and Nirvana and making a new album in the 90s. Um, and then another life in the present where uh, every member of the band is just an incredible inspiration to female artists, queer artists, outsider artists, experimental artists trying to find their way in a really tricky, thorny, complicated world of music making where you're just striving for some kind of, you know, freedom and rebelliousness and excitement. And I think the raincoats give that. So I'm sure as you can tell from the huge smile on my face and uh, I'm just really excited to be working on this book. Yes. No, it's fascinating. I mean, really genuinely, because it's, you know, I, I sort of, I love that kind of exploration of little things that you think, you know, like there's the Marine girls, the raincoats, there was art wasn't there in America. And there's also a little band, I say little, that's terribly <laughs> patronizer, called the Dolly Mixtures or Dolly mm -hmm. Mixture, who, you know, are three piece, I think, from Cambridge. And they were just, you know, all those bands. And then you had Tallulah Gosh. So I, you know, I do find that, you know, those scenes really intriguing and that world of indie pop, which I know the raincoats isn't quite indie pop, but it's close, isn't it? I don't know. What is indie pop? That's what I say. Anyway, yeah, well, but <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> what is it? Yeah, <laughs> what is it? It's kind of yes, it's it's kind of a broad stroke, but it's kind of yeah, yeah. The raincoats are definitely. I think with indie, I suppose I put it down a little bit eighty three onwards, but there was those bands before. It didn't kind of have a name. Perhaps it did. I don't know, post punk or yeah, something. Yeah, I, I mean, the raincoats often get categorized as post punk. Their first, you know album uh full-length album was in 1979 but they recorded an ep before that on rough trade and uh i think in some ways they had a kind of ethos of post-punk and certainly a punk ethos but i think if you want to you know turn that kind of genre into a certain type of sound the raincoats are doing something really different um so very hard to categorize perhaps. yeah but really <laughs> yeah. important actually it's interesting with the with this book i've just mm -hmm. i just realized that you know having brought the, you know, the hit girl but there was also quite a few yeah. women have written books that i've done recently alice mm -hmm. oh god from la she's really a really big cheese um, yes, I'm I'm gonna really forget all the people I've interviewed recently. But there, I, I guess I'm not guessing. There are a lot of people who've started writing their book, haven't there? There's been, you know, th those publications are coming out. And I know I think this year Dorothy Max Pryor brought out a book mm. on her sort of life as well, which is an amazing yeah. book. And yeah, yeah, yeah. so I think I think the narrative is getting generally you know, just told, you know, like you were saying earlier about the voice, people's the person you paraphrased about well, you've got you've got the voice use it or lose it and people say well, okay yeah, yeah. I'll just use it then mm -hmm. and then there is an audience and I think they're oh yes and there is a story which kind of adds to the length the depth to to a decade that I find kind of fas fas fascinating I mean every decade is fascinating but it's when you start working down you think oh well this is really interesting there's some really quirky but fascinating people in here and um yeah I think it's great that so many people are writing the narrative now so there you go. Yeah. And I mean, I think too, one thing for, you know, readers to think about truly when they pick up some of these books is to think, wow, how would I have thought about this scene or this moment in time if I had read this book first? 
right? Because we so often get those kinds of so-called definitive histories of a particular period or band or label. And it's really hard then to think of anything that comes after as, you know, really essential to the story. Rather, you know, it's often thought of as this is, you know, um, a kind of supplement in some way. But I really urge readers to think, you know, what would happen if I recentered myself? What would happen if I rethought of this history and got the start of this history from this new book that came out and then went back and kind of dove into the others? I think you get a totally different position from which to start thinking. And you realize then that it's not just about reorienting yourself in terms of histories of music and marginalized voices in the music world, but it's about learning to reorient yourself in terms of all kinds of histories and learning that histories are written in various ways. And there's always kind of a different angle from which to approach something. Yes, this is very true. And it, <laughs> he says confidently waving his finger. Yeah, <laughs> because actually I did interview bizarrely a person who obviously was in an indie band in the late 80s and he was a historian and is obviously gone very conservative and doesn't really like the story of now other, you know, like the whole thing about, you know, slavery being told and, you know, the colonial past of, of countries like the Brit, you know, like Great Britain, you know, and it's almost like he feels, I could sense that he was feeling quite touchy about like, I think we've had enough now. We've had enough people talk. We've had enough history. It's been told by these people and we want to accept it. We don't want to have this other bit of history that no one's told, 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 talked about being then sort of broadcast and pushed in our faces. And it's like, well, I'm not sure it's being pushed in our face. It's just being told because it hasn't been told before, but it is still things that happen. So you can't say it's made up. It's not like a false narrative. It's like a narrative, but we're a bit embarrassed and I feel a little bit like, oh, that's a bit awkward, isn't it? But it's important to tell it. And it's yeah. so, yeah, so I, yeah, I completely agree. I think, as long as it's the truth, and obviously we live in a bit of a post-truth age with some politicians, but as long as it's the truth and it's out there, it's it's there and, and people can choose whether to read it or not, but at least all those voices are being heard. That's my theory. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the issues is that when histories are written um, and they are kind of become the kind of de facto definitive histories of a moment or, you know, any any given thing, the idea gets perpetuated that that is, in fact, the definitive history or this kind of history with a big capital H that doesn't have any other parts to it or can't be kind of deconstructed in any way. And you've always got to excavate. So always excavate. That's my that's my directive to yes. readers and writers. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, it's it's it is fascinating. And it also has that thing that when people do have another voice in a history, this is my theory, it's interesting how some people who moan about freedom of speech and say, oh, you can't say anything without offending people, then get really offended when they hear another part of the history. And you, and you think now you're shutting them down. So how does this work? Because you're talking about yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a confused world we live in, really, isn't it? Let's face it. But I think the main thing is, yes, to tell the history and tell, and people to have their voices heard. And um, yes, it's it can only be a good thing. So that's my theory. Anyway, look, oh, yes, it was Alice Bag. That was the person. I was oh, oh, I love, I love Alice Bag. <laughs> yes. yes. But- Love was- the bags. Yes, that's a story of punk that uh, that everyone should know about and gets, you know, highlighted in uh, Jen's book, Hit Girls. So it's very excited to see that uh, that uh, piece by Alice Bag in the book and to also see uh, the bags highlighted in that book. Yeah, such a such a phenomenal band, such yes. a fierce, awesome mm-hmm. band. And that, dear listener, is the end of the interview, apart from the emotional goodbye. But let's uh, just leave it there. A massive thank you to Audrey Golden for giving me the time for that. The book, um, you probably guessed that already, but um, I thought I'll just tell you again. It's titled, I Thought I Heard You Speak, Women at Factory Records, available um, for more good bookshops, etc., etc. And also that's come out on White Rabbit Books, so uh, do check it out. This has been David Eastall, The C86 Show. If you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86 Show. These interviews have all been archived on Spotify, iTunes and Podbeam. It's true. Anyway, do check them out. They're fascinating. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.